It's so good to see all of you here. Welcome to Easter with Purpose. Can we just thank our worship teams, our bands, our choir and orchestra? We so appreciate them. It's so good to see all of you. And I just want to welcome those of you that are here in the worship center with us. We want to thank and welcome those of you that are joining us online right now that are a part of our uh, community terrace that are meeting the community terrace. We want to welcome Purpose Espanol and our Arabic services. And, and we also want to welcome our three microsite worshiping communities that meet all around the community of Pomona. Can we just give everyone a little welcome and thanks for being here. It's so good to see you. Well, my name is Eric, and I am one of the teaching pastors here at, at Purpose Church. And I want to start by asking you a question. Have you ever had a moment where you said something or you did something that had a big effect, like a really big effect, maybe even a bigger effect than you had thought it would? I remember about 16 years ago when my wife Sarah and I were just friends, but you better believe I wanted to marry her. We were just friends at this point. We, uh, she invited me out to her college to hang out with her for the day. Day. And, and as, we were, as I was heading out there, she said, you know, Eric, uh, I want you to go to dinner with my best friend Katrina and her boyfriend Blake. Now, this is on a Monday night. And she said, Eric, on the following Saturday, Blake is going to propose to Katrina. Blake is going to ask Katrina to be his wife. And then my wife Sarah said, and I've been tasked with designing and creating the surprise engagement party. And Sarah said, I talked with Blake and he said I could invite Invite you. And I thought, oh my goodness, I'm being invited to the most exclusive event. I'm so excited for this. And then it dawned on me that I couldn't make it to this surprise engagement party because I had some event that Saturday that I couldn't get out of. And so I was devastated. I'm meeting these people for the first time. And so I said to Sarah before I arrived, uh, before we went to dinner, I said, Sarah, would it be okay if I thanked Blake for inviting me to the surprise engagement party? And she said, yeah, of course, of course. So we sit down at dinner and I'm meeting them for the very first time. I'm sitting right here and Blake is right in front of me and Sarah is right next to me and Katrina is right in front of her. And, and for the first 15 minutes, everything contained in my brain, all the witty things or creative ideas or interesting thoughts, they were coming out and it was a great conversation. And then all of a sudden the well went dry really quickly and I had not a whole lot more to say. And all of a sudden I started to get a little nervous and, and anxious and my palms started to get sweaty and I didn't know what to say or what to do. And so I just looked at Blake in that moment and I said, Blake, thank you for inviting me to the party on Saturday. I can't be there. And there was silence. <laughs> and everyone stared at me and it was really uncomfortable and weird and, and I got more awkward and more weird and I, I just looked at Blake and I said, Blake, uh, the party on Saturday. I can't be at your party on Saturday. And, and again, nothing. And, and I was getting any reaction from anyone around me. And so I don't know why, but I just looked at Blake and I said, Blake, I can't come to your engagement party on Saturday. I have something else going on. <laughs> Friends, the moral of the story, don't tell me if you're getting engaged, okay? <laughs> I'll find out on Instagram later. No, 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 really though. There was a direct correlation between what I said and what I did and the impact of that statement. I ruined their engagement. Now, I need to let you know that couple got married. They're happily married. Everything's okay. But you see, today we're talking about the story of Jesus. We're talking about the resurrection of Jesus, Jesus the, the biggest cause in the history of the world with the greatest effect then, now, and for all of eternity, and for every single one of us gathered here or watching at home. You see, the most interesting thing about Jesus of Nazareth, that, that first century Jewish rabbi, was that he claimed to be God. In fact, his followers, his followers claimed that they saw him rise from the dead. You see, the historical event of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, if it happened, has real and eternal effects for your life and for my life. 
It was almost 2,000 years ago that a group of Christians were gathering in the south central part of Greece in, in a city that, called, that was called Corinth, and they received a letter from a guy named Paul. Now, Paul had become famous for trying to destroy the church, for trying to destroy Christianity until he met Christ until Jesus showed up to him in a powerful way that radically transformed his life. So much so that Paul went from trying to destroy the church to literally giving his life to build the church. Well, this, this Paul writes this letter in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 to this group of Christians wanting to give them some confidence in the resurrection. Wanting to give them some reason, some assurance that they can hold for the claim that Jesus Christ rose from the dead because after all, some were really skeptical as they should be. Now, I know we're in church, but let's lean in for a minute. It's a little crazy, right? And some of you already know this and you came here with this suspicion. It's a little crazy that a group of people claimed that Jesus Christ not just died on the cross, but that he rose from the dead, that Jesus actually rose from the dead. That is a ridiculous, crazy claim. In fact, the claim that Jesus Christ rose from the dead is absolutely ridiculous unless it happened. And if it happened, then it's reality. And its effects are eternal for you and for me. And so when the Apostle Paul writes this letter in 1 Corinthians 15, he wants to give them some reasons they can believe in the resurrection. And so he provides some evidence. In fact, several pieces of evidence. I'm just going to look at two of them real quick. The first piece of evidence that he gives is he says, when Jesus rose from the dead, he appeared to Peter and the rest of the disciples those first followers of Jesus. Why is this significant? Because on Good Friday, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, none of his disciples were willing to die with him. They loved him, they appreciated his teachings, but they were not willing to die alongside Jesus. But then on Resurrection Sunday, they saw with their own eyes Jesus back from the dead and it changed everything for them. They ended up scattering, yeah, amen, right? They ended up scattering. All throughout the known world, and they couldn't stop, and they wouldn't stop telling everybody Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And what's absolutely mind blowing is this it cost them everything. I mean, Peter, he was crucified upside down in Italy. Philip was tortured to death in North Africa. Thomas was murdered in India. And Matthias was burned alive in Syria. Not because they had walked with Jesus at one point, but because they couldn't stop and they wouldn't stop telling everyone they could that Jesus Christ is Lord and that he rose from the dead. The second piece of evidence that the apostle Paul provides is he says, when Jesus appeared, he appeared to James. And the James that Paul is referring to is the brother of Jesus. Now, this is really significant because in the Gospels, which are the historical accounts of the life of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they tell the story that his, disciples, that his brothers, the brothers and sisters of Jesus, that they weren't totally sure about him that they were actually really skeptical about Jesus, that they doubted and some of his family even thought he was crazy because he claimed to be God. But then his brother James saw with his own eyes, saw his brother come back from the dead and it changed everything. In fact, James ends up writing a letter that shows up in the pages of the New Testament in our Bible. And in the beginning of his letter, he starts it this way. I, James, a servant of the Lord Jesus. He didn't say I'm James, the brother of Jesus. He said, no, no, I'm a servant of the Lord Jesus. And it ended up costing James his life, not because he was the brother of Jesus, but because he couldn't stop and he wouldn't stop telling the world, my brother is my Lord and my savior. I gotta ask you a question. How many of you have siblings? Raise your hand if you have a sibling. Raise your hand. Okay, simple question. What would it take to convince your sibling that you are God? What would that take? I'll tell you what it would take. It would take a miracle. Kind of like the resurrection. Well, Paul 
Paul continues in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, I'm humbled that Jesus would also appear to me because I spent so much time persecuting the church. And then in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10, Paul says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. You see, the story of the resurrection is not just about us gathering together on some Sunday to sing some songs and to read some words and to go on with our life. No, no, there is an effect to the resurrection of Jesus. In fact, there are innumerable effects on history and on our lives when it comes to the resurrection of Jesus, but I just wanna look at four of them with you today. The first effect of the resurrection of Jesus is this. Jesus will show you truth. Jesus will show you truth. The apostle Paul continues in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 14 and 17. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile or it's empty, it's dead, it's, it's purposeless. And you are still in your sins. Paul makes a really bold claim here. He says this, if Jesus Christ did not rise from the dead, he did not die for your sins. If Jesus Christ did not rise from the dead, then he is not truth, he is a liar. But if he did rise from the dead, which all the evidence points in that direction, then everything he said, everything he did is true and is good news for the whole world. And if our culture... If our culture is right, that we live in a world with no absolute truth, then we are all in trouble, deep trouble. Because as soon as your truth or his truth or her truth intersects, collides with my truth, or somebody gets hurt, we get hurt in the process, our truths overlap in a way that collide with each other, then we are in trouble. And yet it was in a culture in Jesus's day with a plethora of philosophies, all trying to answer the question, who is God? And how do you have a relationship with God in mass confusion? That, very similar to the culture we live in today, Jesus said these words in John 14, verse six. Jesus answered, I am the way. I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, this isn't worth anything. If Jesus did rise from the dead, then he and he alone is our source of truth. Effect number two of the resurrection, Jesus will give you peace. The Apostle Paul says in Philippians 4, 5 to 7, the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You see, because Jesus rose from the dead, because he is alive, he is near to us. And this means that God's peace is actually his presence. And here's the direct effect that the resurrection of Jesus can have on your life and my life. Even though we don't know what the future holds, we know who holds the future. That, that even though there are parts of our lives that don't make sense, sentences, chapters, whole seasons of our life that just don't make sense. We can cling to the peace of the resurrected Jesus that he is writing a better story with our lives than we could ever write on our own. And this became personal for us as a family several years ago when our oldest daughter Brinley was born with a congenital heart disease. The cardiologist told us that our baby girl was gonna need open heart surgery. Well, that one open heart surgery led to a second open heart surgery. And I remember during those years and continuing on into the future, we cling to the peace that only God can give us. We cling to promises like Philippians chapter four that God can give us peace when there's parts of our lives and seasons of our lives that don't make sense. And maybe that's what you need today. Maybe you need the peace 
of the resurrected Jesus. Effect number three, Jesus will help you forgive. Paul says in Ephesians chapter four, verse 31, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander along with every form of malice. And maybe at this moment, you're beginning to lean in. Because if you're honest with yourself, these words describe where you're at right now. And imagine there's some of you here who you would give anything to be less bitter. You'd give anything to deal with the rage, the anger, the cynicism that's in your heart. How do we do that? Well, the apostle Paul says in the next verse, verse 32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. You see, why is forgiveness such a central theme in Jesus' teaching and in the rest of the New Testament. It's because the resurrection of Jesus guarantees that if we put our trust in Jesus Christ, he will forgive us. You see, it's our sin that separated us from God. It's the thoughts, words, and actions that dishonor God and dishonor others and disobey his word that actually creates a chasm and a distance between us and God. And and the Lord knows that when we receive Jesus Christ's forgiveness, that we will be free. But here's the interesting part. When you're truly forgiven, like at a soul level, you know I'm forgiven by the God of the universe. That what Jesus Christ did on the cross, his sinless and perfect sacrifice absorbed all of our sin. And it becomes a little bit easier to forgive others. And why is it so important to forgive others? Well, because unforgiveness travels with a bunch of destructive friends. To help me with this, I need my friends Malik and Kasai. Malik and Kasai, can you guys come up here? Can you guys all welcome Malik and Kasai? Come on up here, gentlemen. Malik and Kasai are two of our high school guys in our high school ministry here. So let me take this little rope real quick. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Kasai. So here's the thing about unforgiveness, is that unforgiveness travels with resentment. That unforgiveness travels with bitterness and and rage and anger. You weren't ready for that, were you? (laughs) Dude, you thought thought this was just a Santa jelly belly? No, this is Vin Diesel under here, bro. Come on. (laughs) Come on, dude. You see, here's the thing about unwillingness to forgive is that it creates bitterness and resentment and anger within us. And maybe some of you, you're experiencing this right now that with every relationship you're trying to get into, the way you're trying to interact in new ways in the workplace, or you wanna treat your family better, but you just can't help but bring resentment and bitterness and anger and frustration with you. And you're wondering, what do I do about this? And, And maybe some of you even settled for just saying, that's who I am. I'm just a bitter person. I'm just an angry, resentful person. Maybe you've even thought, well, bitterness and resentment are hanging on to me. Could it be, could it be that you're holding on to them? When the Bible talks about forgiveness, it uses a word that means to let go. Could it be that your first step towards healing and freedom towards getting rid of the bitterness and the rage and the resentment and the anger and all those things is to choose to forgive. But friends, you can't do that on your own. You can't do that on your own and you don't have to. The effect of the resurrection is that you have available to you the power of the resurrected Christ through the Holy Spirit to forgive those that don't even deserve our forgiveness. Could you guys give these gentlemen a round of applause? Thank you, guys. Which is why I've been trying something recently. Whenever somebody frustrates me or my patience wears thin or someone hurts my feelings. I've I've just tried to practice this. Forgiveness received, forgiveness given. Grace received, grace given. 
Mercy, receive, mercy, give. And you see, the next time somebody cuts you off on the freeway, the, the next time somebody steals a promotion that was yours, the next time a close family or friend says something that triggers an insecurity within you before you resort to bitterness and anger and rage and resentment and the old you will try to lean into the power of the resurrected Christ and say, I've been forgiven so I can forgive. I've been given grace. I can give grace. I've, re I've received mercy. I can give mercy. It reminds me of my mother-in-law, Sally, when she had been married several years to her husband, Pat, they had uh, two daughters, an older daughter, and then their younger daughter is my wife, Sarah. One day when my wife, Sarah, was only a year and a half, all four of them were driving to a birthday party in the afternoon and a drunk driver hit them. It resulted in my mother-in-law's husband, Pat, and her oldest daughter being killed. This obviously was so traumatic and uh, difficult, unbearable to go through, to lose her husband and her oldest daughter. Well, when the trial came around, the man who was driving drunk was convicted, sentenced, and during the victim impact statement, my mother-in-law stood up in front of a crowded courtroom with cameras, everybody wondering what would she say to this guy? Well, she looked him in the eye with every eye on her, and she said, I forgive you. She would tell you that was the beginning of her healing journey, and she could only do that through the resurrected power of Christ. Number four, and finally, Jesus will save you forever. The most important of all, the effect of the resurrection is Jesus will save you forever. Romans 10, 9, Paul says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Paul says, you've got to acknowledge that you're not the Lord of the universe. You've got to acknowledge that you don't have what it takes to save yourself, but there is one, the king of the universe, who died in your place and rose from the dead, and he alone can save you forever. But it requires acknowledging where you're at. It reminds me of when my oldest son, Charlie, was only about two years old. He was sitting in the living room and he was pretend reading this children's Bible and he had it upside down, but it didn't matter. It was still just cute. And my wife, Sarah, and I were in the kitchen marveling at this moment when all of a sudden, Charlie ripped a page of the Bible. So we ran over and said, Charlie, what are you doing? You, you, you can't rip the Bible. And, and without even blinking, two-year-old Charlie looked at us and said, I didn't rip it, God ripped it, okay? <laughs> now, now, I'm, yeah, I'm not a theologian, I'm just, I'm, I just leaned in and I said, Charlie, look, dude, it's a pretty bad sin to rip a Bible. It's like really bad to blame it on God. Like, that's just not cool. <laughs> and so we had to talk to Charlie about taking ownership, taking responsibility. Several weeks later, he had a monster truck that he loved, and during a temper tantrum, he smashed that monster truck. And again, we talked about taking responsibility and, and for the next week or so, he would walk around the house saying, I broke my truck. I broke my truck. I broke my truck. And one afternoon, Charlie and I were driving. He was in his car seat and our eyes caught each other in the rear view mirror. And he said, I broke my truck, daddy. I broke my truck. And I said, I know, buddy, I know. And then this smile formed on his face as he asked me this question. He said, maybe daddy can fix it. I said, no, I cannot fix your truck, buddy. I don't know how to do that. Can't fix that truck. But it was a spiritual moment. It was this amazing moment, this reminder that friends, you and I broke it. That God created this place for us to live in perfect relationship with him, in perfect relationship with each other. And we broke it. Our sin broke it. Our sin created distance between us and God. But I'm here to tell you that what we celebrate on Good Friday and the punctuation of Resurrection Sunday is that God fixed it. Yeah. That God fixed it. 
and he fixed it because he loves you. Because he loves you. Because he loves you. In a moment, we're gonna give you an opportunity that some of you are here today and you have never begun a relationship with Jesus. And this is not just any other Easter. This is a divine appointment. God brought you here to tell you face to face that he died for you, he did rise for you, and that he wants to be the Lord of your life. After that, we're gonna have an opportunity for baptisms. Maybe some of you have never been baptized before. We have everything you need in the North parking lot. We have towels, we have shorts, we have shirts, we have a changing room, we have warm water. We have everything you need to take that next step in making your faith public. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, it says this, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. You know what this means? This means that if you will bring the worst of yourself to Jesus, the sin and the brokenness in your life, if you will bring the worst of yourself to Jesus, he will give you the best of himself. That you'll, if, if you'll confess, if you'll admit, I'm a sinner in need of a savior, he, he promises to be faithful. That means he will not abandon you like maybe others have. He, he promises to be just. That means that his sinless, perfect death on a cross and resurrection satisfies the need for forgiveness. That you can be completely forgiven of everything you've ever done. He promises to forgive you. This means he's not going to hold it over your head. He's not going to hold your past over you. He wants to free you. And then lastly, he promises to transform you from the inside out. This is what's available to you and I. You see, religion, religion simply says, I messed up. My dad is going to kill me. So I've got to earn my way back. But the gospel the true story of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus says, I messed up. I need to call my dad. And I want to give you an opportunity. I want to give you an opportunity to call on God because the late Billy Graham said that most people miss heaven by 18 inches. What he meant by that is the average distance between your head and your heart is 18 inches. And he said, there's a lot of people that come to Easter services or people who grew up in the church or who know some Bible verses that have information in their head, but it has not traveled the distance to their heart where they have made the decision, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, and only he can save me forever. I've got to be honest with you. Attending church won't save you. Having Christian family members or Christian friends won't save you. Knowing a lot of Bible verses won't save you. It is only, as the Apostle Paul says, declaring with your life that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. That is the only thing that can save you. And in a few moments, in a few moments, we're going to sing a song together that says, but the miracle that I just can't get over is that my name is registered in heaven. This is my testimony from death to life because grace rewrote my story, I'll testify. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come. You see, God isn't done with you yet. God will rewrite your story if you'll give him your life and your name can be registered in heaven. And here's how. I wanna invite everyone in this room right now to close their eyes. This is a moment between you and your maker, between you and the resurrected Jesus. And I wanna ask you a question. Have you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? There's some of you here who have been around church, been around Christianity before. You come to Easter services, but you have not said yes to Jesus before. For some of you, your life has been a mess. And this is the answer that you've been looking for. I don't know every detail of your story, but God does. And he loved you so much that he died on the cross and rose from the dead so that he could be your Lord and Savior and so you could follow him now and for all of eternity. 
with every eye closed, if you're in this room and you've never begun a relationship with Jesus before, you've never received his forgiveness, this is your moment. And I wanna invite you right now with every eye closed to raise your hand in the air. To raise your hand in the air saying, Jesus Christ, I am gonna make you the Lord of my life. I want to receive your forgiveness. I want you right now to raise your hand wherever you're at. God, I thank you for these hands in the balcony, on the floor. I thank you for these hands that are being raised, these decisions that are being made for the first time to make you, Jesus, the Lord of their lives. Would you, Holy Spirit, come inside of them and may they follow you every day of their life. With every eye closed, there's still some of you here who at one point you were following Jesus. At one point he was the Lord of your life. But if you're honest with yourself, he has not been these last several months, years, maybe even decades. And you're recognizing that it was a divine appointment God brought you here, that you wanna recommit your life to Christ. You wanna recommit that he is gonna be the Lord of every part of your life. If that's you and this Easter Sunday is about you recommitting your life to Jesus, I want you to raise your hand right now so I can pray for you. Wherever you're at, raise your hand as a way of saying, Jesus, I recommit my life to you. God, I thank you for all these people that are saying, Jesus, I'm coming home. Thank you that you are not the God who holds grudges, but you're the God who hands out grace. Jesus, I pray that you would help these people to continue to follow you with every part of their lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, hey, before we transition into the next song, something really powerful happened in this place. That there were several of you who for the first time said yes to Jesus. Or, or maybe you said, I'm coming back. I'm recommitting my life to Christ. The thing about following Jesus is it's not a solo sport. That there's no such thing as an only child in the family of God. You were designed and created to follow Jesus in community. And the Bible says that all of heaven is celebrating right now over the eternal transforming decisions that were made in this place. And we as a community, we wanna celebrate those things. And so I'm gonna ask you, I wanna invite you, if you feel comfortable, I wanna invite you to be bold and to stand with me on the count of three as a way of declaring this Easter that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. And maybe you didn't raise your hand, but you're recognizing right now God is calling you to stand, to publicly declare your faith in Christ for the first time or you're recommitting. I want you to join me on the count of three so that we can celebrate with all of heaven. Stand with me on three. One, two, three. Woo! Woo! Yes! Yes! Yes, Lord! Yes! Yes! Now, while you're standing right now, while you're standing right now, I, I just have one question for you. And I need you to out loud, with all you got in you, say yes to this. And the question is this, is Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior? Yes. Then welcome to the family of God. Can we all stand together? Let's all stand together and sing one last time.